In this interview, I got to chat with editor Jennifer Lane, who most recently cut Oppenheimer for Christopher Nolan, but has established herself as one of the most sought-after editors working today. I mean, I just did this beer project with Darren Aronofsky that was actually a really good palate cleanser after Oppenheimer because it was so different. You'll get to hear how she only had four weeks to cut the first version of Oppenheimer, what it's like to collaborate with Christopher Nolan, and why she thinks editors should steal from each other in order to find fresh approaches to tackling a film. If you enjoyed this interview, do sign up for Cut Daily, my free weekly newsletter that delivers a concise insight of post-production knowledge direct to your inbox. Sign up for free at cut-daily.com. What's your daily work routine when you're in the trenches of the creative part of the edit? Yeah. You mean like during the assembly? For me, like it's a very different process during the shoot and the assembly versus working with the director. Is there one you are more interested in? <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe the assembly side of it when it's just you and the footage. Yeah, I feel like that's almost the more daunting part of it. But I feel like over the years, I've tried to come up with different ways to kind of tackle that part of it because I feel like it can be really stressful or it can be like there's days where not much is going on and it's hard to structure your time kind of during that whole section. So for me, it's coming in, talking to my crew kind of like relaxing, figuring out like what's happening on set and then just like hyper focusing, you know, an hour at a time, just like, okay, how much can I get done in one hour? And just like, I found that after years of attacking the assembly, that kind of works the best for me of just many, many goals. Cause I think, yeah, an assembly can be very um, overwhelming. Just the first stabs at putting the film together. It's like starting anything, you know? Yeah, so I think for me, it's like structuring my day so I can find some joy in the day and have lunch with my crew or go run an errand and then like put timers on for like 30 minutes. I'm going to spend just like 30 minutes on this scene and see how many different versions I can cut and what I learn in the 30 minutes. I'm going to just like live in this scene and then try to move on because the other thing is you don't want to like get bogged down in something, but I can get very bogged down in things. So yeah, I think it's just kind of managing that is difficult, but I've found ways to do it. How do you go about building a scene from scratch? I know that for Matt's interview, like you do kind of the string out of each line by line, pick the best take and then stack them to lift them up to kind of whichever one you prefer best. But then are you thinking, oh, there's this close up that I want to build to, so I'm going to work backwards from that. Or you kind of start from the beginning of the scene or you, I know the editor of Life of Pi, he would cut all the wides. The whole scene was just wides. You cut all the wides and then he'd cut all the close ups and he'd cut all the medium shots and then he would mash together the three different scenes that he'd made to kind of pick the best of the best and kind of work it together. But can you talk me through your process of tackling a scene or does it change every time? Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Is that Tim Squires? That's a really, I'm going to yeah, steal that yeah. one. I think, I think I'm, I'm going to steal that one because I think what I've learned is I worked for kind of one director for a really long time and that's the method I learned from him, the one you just mentioned. But then I've learned that it's actually okay to be flexible and kind of deviate from that so like I think with Chris's movies it doesn't necessarily that doesn't necessarily jive with that process but I think every movie is different which is why I was like I'll steal that Tim Squires thing for one movie and I think it's actually really important as an editor that I've learned actually about myself is because I was in kind of that rigid mode for a while where I did that one specific way is that um changing things up is actually good for your brain and good you know get you out of rhythms and things to discover new things so like on this movie, it was really different for me because I came in after the movie had wrapped. And now I was really, a lot of editors are actually really daunted by that because I asked a couple editors, like, how do you, do you think this is a good idea that I'm doing this? And a lot of them were like, don't do it. I mean, obviously do it, but like, it's going to be really hellish because you have just all the footage lumped together and then just a couple of weeks to cut it as opposed to getting in footage incrementally over the shoot. But I actually found I really loved it because in a way, like the incremental of a production I realized I found I find kind of stressful and I found ways to deal with it but the idea of just having the enormous task of having all the footage and just like three or four weeks to cut it all together because it was so enormous it almost became meaningless in a way it was like okay like I can only do what I can do and so I actually really relaxed into it and I had the best time ever not that I would I, I wouldn't like pitch pitch myself to do that on every movie but like it was a really cool it was also just a cool way to have to be forced to do something different, which is why I learned like, okay, so I can do it differently each time and I can still edit a good movie. And I think it just like allows you to trust your instincts as an editor and be like, I'm not just my methods. 
if that makes sense. This is a creative task. And, and that's why I find it difficult to talk about editing because it's like a creative, intuitive task of like putting the film together. And it's very hard to talk about how you do that. But I think gaining confidence as an editor is putting yourself through many different experiences that are new and scary. And it's funny that you asked me that question. This is like a really interesting question that you've asked me because for a long time, I felt like if I didn't do the method that you mentioned in the beginning, that I was like going to fuck up my whole editing flow. And so I was like almost afraid. I remember on Tenet, I was like desperately trying to do that method, but it wasn't working in the sense that like, there was too much other stuff to do. It didn't really translate to some of the action stuff and like Chris like it didn't work and it was like kind of freeing to be like okay I just have to like do something different and just edit the movie in a different like I don't need my methods to edit a good movie if that makes sense yeah yeah totally I love it to say yeah you edit from your gut as opposed to yeah like strategically thinking because I, I know some editors will break down the script and they'll be thinking okay this is the key line and I want to be on the reaction for that thing and but do you feel like you just respond to the performances in the footage and remember oh yeah there was there was a great shot in here and you might not be thinking this is exactly why i like it but you kind of gravitate towards it is that would you say that's kind of how you find your way for the footage yeah and i think just being honest with yourself as like a person who loves films and just loves movies and like every scene like i'll just get like if i'm just watching a scene and i start watching the footage and i just start watching it and i can't stop watching it like or yeah, to your point, like one, one particular performance I find riveting, I'll grab that and try to make it work with that. And then I'll spend 15 minutes on that. And it doesn't work at all. And it's terrible. And then I'll go back and keep watching the footage. And like, I think a big thing about editing too, is like not being afraid when you go down a rabbit hole of coming back out of it. Cause I think with editing, you can get really lost in those kind of rabbit holes of like, okay. And that's why I think the Tim Squires thing is so smart too. It's kind of that idea of like, cut it on wides, cut it on closes, make a mishmash. And then that could be a complete failure too. And like, but it, through that failure, you find a successful thread. And it's like, I think that's what's so interesting about editing is so fascinating too, in the sense of like, how like how would two different people edit the same movie? And would it, would it end up being the same movie? Like, who knows? And like, there's so many like daunting rabbit hole, weird things you can go down with that road that my brain quickly goes down that I just have to stop my brain from going down. So, um, but I think that's why I may be good at my job because I am obsessive and can go down those rabbit holes, but I need to bring myself out of those rabbit holes. But I'm also, I can cut a scene 30 different ways and I find that exciting, not like annoying. So um, I'm just always up for experimentation. I've once interviewed Julia Block, who's um, another editor. Oh from yeah, I know her, yeah. Yeah, and she worked on um, a Terrence Malick movie a long time ago. She said they had this kind of like organic freeform, try anything in the editorial and like different editors would kind of swing in and out at different times. And it sounds like, that would be super fun and like you would get lost in it but then yeah. without the constraint of hey you've got to get Christopher Nolan's movie kind of four weeks um exactly. as opposed to Terrence Malick's two years of you know let's just see yeah and I think to that point I really like one of the things I admire and love working on um Chris's movies that I've said before but is that his movies both feel incredibly there's a lot of rules and constraints and like he hits deadlines and you know, time feels very like important to him. And like, you know, the clock is running and you're just trying to hit those deadlines and get, you know, work. But also I feel like within the time is like incredibly relaxed and creative and flowing. And it's like this weird dichotomy of both like very rigid and not rigid at all and incredibly creative and free flowing. So I think I've learned actually a lot just from working on two movies with him of like, you know, to your point of like, to have that kind of like, interesting theoretical Terrence Malicky kind of like flow but also not like go too far with it if that makes sense yeah 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 um, but that is really yeah it's very interesting that Julia and, mentioned that it's crazy yeah yeah she's such a uh, great editor as well um yeah I love her with working with Chris does he like to sit in the whole time or is he just kind of pop in and out and see things because I saw a thing where he said that you guys didn't really do an assembly per se in terms of the whole movie back to back but you didn't each scene then he'd work each scene with you how did that whole assembly process go when he then was in the mix as well yeah so in this particular case because i missed the production he gave me four weeks to kind of just work with the footage and he was really sweet and said like i don't expect you to cut 
this whole movie in four weeks. Obviously, yeah. that's insane. But I do want you to get familiar with the footage as if you were on the shoot. So I want you to know. I want you to watch all the footage, but I don't expect you to like cut the film. You know, the whole thing. But I actually ended up cutting the whole film because in order to watch all the footage, you just naturally want to throw shit in a timeline that you like. So I ended up doing a rough pass of the whole film just because it felt silly not to, because that's what my brain does anyway. And then what happened, but see the thing about Chris, and I learned this on Tenet is like, he doesn't watch an assembly from beginning to end. But again, most director writers don't do that. And I've typically only worked with director writers because their brain, it's like they can't comprehend that. And I think it's so brilliant of them that they don't because, and Chris and I have spoke about this before is an editor's assembly is just my first rough kind of ideas of the movie. It's not me presenting the film as like, here's your movie. Do you know what I mean? Or like, here's what I think of your movie. And so it's so daunting that like this idea that a director would come in and like sit and watch your entire like rough cut, you know, it's like, of course there's going to be problems. And I don't even know how beneficial it is necessarily, though I know a lot of directors find it beneficial because they kind of just need to wrap their head around the whole mess of it all, you know, but I think for writer directors, like they're used to writing and that doesn't make sense to them. To them, it's like you watch the first couple scenes and then you're like, okay, we know what we need to do. Let's go start doing it. And then you work on those couple scenes and then you watch those couple scenes with the next couple scenes. And then you might win the fucking lottery and there's one or two scenes that are pretty fucking good. And then you keep, and then you move on, which like happens sometimes, which is really fun for me where I'm like, Oh, that actually works. But it's never the scenes that I think are going to work. And it's funny. I feel like on Oppenheimer, it was always funny when we'd go to watch the next scene and I'd be like, Oh God. And Chris was like, stop saying that. But it was always funny because the scenes that I would be the most embarrassed about usually had like the least amount of issues. It was so fascinating. And then the scenes that I was like, this one's good. He's going to like this one. It was like, wow, we need to start from scratch. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, it's such a good lesson in humility and like, just like having no ego, you know? But um, no, it's really fun. But so, yeah, that is kind of how we do it. But so the whole film needs to be cut because every time we start fine cutting, the scenes then he wants to watch like the next 20 minutes so it has to exist you know so it's kind of funny when he was like don't worry about putting it all together because I knew that he actually did expect me to put it all together but he was trying (laughs) to be nice he was trying to be nice but yeah there's no like temp music and I don't put like temp effects or anything like he doesn't expect any of that whereas some directors do like they expect like a full temp score full temp sound effects you know what I mean yeah 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 so I really appreciate that I've never really worked on a film like that before i think with ari he wanted that because it was kind of his first film and he kind of needed that i'm so on hereditary i did it but that was so hard because it was a horror movie so i had to put like all of these crappy like temp sound effects it was it was that was scary i remember julia saying because she wasn't has done quite a lot of horror stuff and just saying how so much about like cutting horror stuff is just about the fine execution at the end because somebody creeping down a corridor can be like either terrifying depending on the timing the pacing and the sound effects and everything or really funny because it just haven't hasn't got the scoring and the creepy totally, sound effect. Totally, totally. It's always a harder genre to do. But I mean, yeah, I can't believe you managed to cut the whole thing in four weeks. And I mean, again, a really, really rough version of it. Yeah, but still, but I mean, there must have been. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the one funny thing I'm sure you heard if you've listened to me is that I kind of breezed over Trinity. Like I didn't really <laughs> spend much time because I knew that Chris and I would spend. You know, we have like a couple of days where you just like really like did that. And so it's like, and also Trinity, like I knew Trinity was going to be amazing. I, I saw the footage. So I just like threw a couple of shots together and moved on. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. I guess like makes sense what you're saying about like not going down the rabbit hole. It's like we will get to that rabbit hole later. Exactly. We're exactly. not going to worry about it for now. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. In terms of where you're at with your editorial career, like, I guess my question was, where do you go from here in terms of... I know, I know, I don't know. It's so funny that you say that because I just went to, like, a little gathering of people that worked on Oppenheimer just to, like, you know, say hi and reconnect. And, like, we all just talked about how much we loved working on the movie. I was talking to Ellen, the costume designer, and she was just... This was such a satisfying experience creatively for most heads of the departments, and I'm sure all of the actors. So it's like, I don't know where I go (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I just did this fear project with Darren Aronofsky that was actually a really good, fun palette cleanser after Oppenheimer because it was so different. Darren is amazing, and it was really fun to meet a new filmmaker. And um, But yeah, like creatively speaking, in terms of doing another like scripted movie project, yeah, it's like Oppenheimer was so fun. I don't know. No idea. <laughs> I mean, I've met directors that you... It's interesting you saw what you said about like you know, two different editors cutting the same thing because it's always interesting when someone says, oh, I'd really love to work with so-and-so because I love their movies. But then it's like, if you work on the movie, maybe you'll change it to something that 
you wouldn't love. But then equally, I think there's also just like that thing of like wanting to work with specific people because you love their taste and their aesthetic and, and you know, yeah, the films and I think, that they make. I think for me, because I've been really lucky to work on different genres, which I think some editors kind of get pigeonholed with specific genres. And like for a while, I was kind of just working on, I was working with Noah Baumbach and I did Manchester by the Sea, but then Ari Aster came along and hired me on Hereditary. And that was such a gift actually, because I'd never done horror. I wasn't really interested in it. And he kind of talked me into it. And it was also really cool to work with a younger filmmaker. He was younger than me. It was his first feature. So I actually like wouldn't mind doing that again. And also I got to work with Ryan Coogler on Wakanda Forever. And I'd never really worked on like big like superhero movie before, but also Ryan comes from Fruitvale and he's such an amazing writer, director, filmmaker. So it was fun to work with him. And for me, I just want to work with people that I find interesting and um it's hard to meet new people. I'm not. <laughs> I'm tired of meeting new people. Like, I would just like to work with, like, Ryan again or Ari again or Chris again. But um, because it is such an intense relationship. But, again, like, I was feeling that after this movie. But then I met Darren Aronofsky and I had the greatest time. So Yeah, yeah. I'd have thought that most filmmakers would be beating a path to your door to get you on their next project. But I guess then you can pick and choose hopefully what which ones yeah i think hollywood's in like a weird place right now because of all the um, strikes which is yeah. why i went into that sphere project but um i don't know i like a lot of directors have editors you know so i think another interesting if i want to have a nice long fruitful career is like establishing relationships with the younger directors so like it was really great to meet ari and ryan kruger is quite young and has a long career ahead of him and just like and he has a production company proximity so I would love to work on things he produces because he produces and works on really interesting projects that, you know, have some political implications and just, I, you know, I want to work on movies that are meaningful and yeah, are yeah. meaningful to people. And maybe I need to work with more younger directors too. <laughs> but um, yeah, because a lot, that's the thing about editing is like a lot of directors have relationships with editors and it's such a specific relationship, but you don't really want to change so it's it's kind of hard whenever people are like, oh, what would be your like fantasy director? It's like, well, it doesn't really matter because some of those fantasy directors probably already have a really great editor, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of weird. I mean, one thing I was going to ask you about, which I haven't really heard many people talk about, which is the role of the editor as, a, as an HOD, as like a head of department within a big project like this. Like, do you have to like, shoulder all of that responsibility or can you kind of hand self up your first assistant as a running a team and that kind of thing? You know, chat with Matt, like you have to find specific people and hire people and you know, you're managing like a whole department. Like how do, yeah. how do you do that? Well, it's funny because I came from that, that like New York uh, smaller movie budget world. So I really over ever only had like one assistant or like maybe I had two assistants. I don't think I ever did. <clears throat> so then when I came on to Tenet, it was crazy. It was like a huge department. And um, luckily the first assistant editor stayed on. Um, this guy, John Lee, who's amazing and had been, had worked on like 10 of Chris's movies. So he became like my best friend and we got along so, and he was so kind to me because there was so much I didn't understand about just, it was just a different process, what they do with the film stuff and the different, the different formats that they shoot and all that stuff. But luckily because me and John had become so close and in a way he ran that department for sure, um, that he moved on to become an editor and he couldn't do Oppenheimer. So I, I was tasked with finding a replacement for him. And it was incredibly daunting. There's just like not a lot of people that can do that job. You know, it's like, it's really uh, technically complicated, but also you have to be quick on your feet. You have to learn a bunch of new shit. You have to talk to so many different people. So anyway, yeah, I had to find his replacement. And then I think on Oppenheimer, like I definitely felt more like I was in charge of the department a little bit just because the whole team was new so i was the i was the veteran this time which was really funny <laughs> even though i'd only done one other movie um and then tina anderson the post producer who did tenet with me it was like the two of us and she's brilliant she works in all of tarantino's movies all of ben affleck's movies she's very familiar with the film world and all of the stuff so between the two of us we were able to kind of like run the department and also have fun. Like everyone was so nice and sweet and funny and smart. And yeah, it was a great team. So I, I guess my approach, I finally learned because I think this idea of being a head of department and running a team was always very daunting to me. But I think my approach now that I've done it, because I would say Oppenheimer was like the first time I had to run, like really be the HOD in the sense that 
like I said, I knew what I was doing this time um, is, um, <laughs> yeah, just to like have fun because I think these jobs can be so time consuming and so stressful and yeah, just to like find ways to not make it stressful and make people laugh. And like, we always had like funny jokes going and like, yeah, it's like working on these movies can be exhausting and like you're away from your family not to circle back to the kids thing, but it's like, if you're going to not put your kids to bed, you better have a couple laughs at dinner. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And the hours are brutal in this industry. So just finding ways to get through it, I think is my approach. Where you're in a position where you can set the culture of how you want the department to feel. And, and that probably sets the experience with so many people who are underneath your leadership is how they experience being on the movie. Yeah. And if you want people to come back and do it with you again, you better make, make it not torture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Jen, thanks so much for your time. Um, we've got to call it to a close, but um, I really appreciate changing it. Up and over was obviously me as one of millions of people who thought it was outstanding, as well as like all of your other credits are outstanding. So thank you. Yeah, it was so fun to talk to you. It's you're, you were just so smart and interesting to talk to. So thank you for that. Because <laughs> I do do some of those other interviews and I don't enjoy them. <laughs> Jen, thanks so much. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you.